Hi, this is Dr. Kim Lee, child and adolescent psychiatrist from South Australia. I am answering today some questions from a year 12 student who is doing their research project on video game addiction. And this student's name is Lachlan. Lachlan has emailed me, uh, has tracked me down online and asked some questions. And I'm here to answer some of those questions on video game addiction. He's looking at how common uh, video game addiction is or the prevalence, its psychological effects on behavior and mental health, and also looking at prevention and treatment. So today I'd just like to you know, focus a little bit more about the prevalence and just go down the rabbit hole of video game addiction and try and explain uh, the way I look at um, video game addiction, how I, how I do my own research. So I'm just going to share my screen. I'll share this page here. So I looked up the world, I put into Google, World Health Organization Gaming Disorder, because uh, in 2018, the World Health Organization recognized gaming disorder as a global uh, phenomenon and syndrome that is affecting many people in their mental health. Now, I've actually um, met the team in Japan, uh, headed by Dr. Susumu Higuchi, who was the person who made the proposal to the World Health Organization that this was an important and worthwhile condition to recognize. So this, this um, I've actually visited this um, addiction center in Japan. I did the exact same thing as Lachlan. I just called, called them, emailed the center, said, this is me, I'm gonna be in Japan, would love to visit your um, hospital. And in the end, they invited me to give them a talk on the Australian perspective. So this article here talks about uh, how they have, um, you know, almost 300 patients for internet addiction. And most of those have a gaming disorder as their main addiction. And most of them were males. So two thirds were males. He said that they have a range of symptoms, but generally are unable to limit the time they spent gaming. They continue to play despite the negative consequences, such as dropping out of school. And he says that three quarters of the patients are students and have, most of them have lost a job. They haven't had a national survey of gaming disorder in Japan. However, a recent national survey of the broader category of internet addiction reported that approximately 1.8 million males 20 years age or older were living with an internet addiction in 2018 just in Japan. Almost three times the number reported in 2013. That's almost like the population of Adelaide. Just imagine everyone in Adelaide being addicted to the internet. So the key thing about this paragraph here is that there is a difference between gaming disorder, also known as video game addiction and internet addiction. So that's a really key thing to remind ourselves. The same survey reported that 1.3 million adult females living with internet addiction up from 0.5 million in 2013. So in a space of five years, it's gone from half a million to almost three times that 1.3 million females with internet addiction. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about this article or this news article was that Higuchi co-authored a recent literature review called Cross-Sectional and Longitudinal Epidemiological Studies of Internet Gaming Disorder and found that the prevalence of internet gaming disorder in the samples reviewed ranged from 0.7% to 27.5%. So what I've done is, what I would normally do is I'd copy this um, italics um, article name here, and then I'd go to Google Scholar, I'd paste it in here, and Google Scholar is kind of like a uh, journal database, and I'll click search, and it'll come up with um, the article, and it'll come up with a PDF or a full view, 
it can also give you the quotation uh, reference marks here and it'll tell you how many people have used this article in their own uh, research. Okay, and they can also look up related articles as well. So if you want to find out more about the prevalence, you can find a whole bunch of other articles here. But I found the article here and I like to look at the abstract, look at the methods, how he came about doing this. And essentially what they did was they searched their databases um, in 2016 and they went through each article and they identified what, what are called cross-sectional studies on prevalence and also longitudinal studies for internet gaming disorder. So uh, what, do you, what do I mean by cross-sectional studies? So cross-sectional is um, one point in time they looked at um, a population and look for how many people at that particular point in time in that group had internet gaming disorder. Longitudinal studies, however, are looking at different time points. So more than one time point, maybe one year, two years, three years. They looked at articles um, from different languages. So in the process, articles, sorry, non-English articles and those studies looking at just gaming were excluded. And as a result, 37 cross-sectional and 13 longitudinal studies were selected. So uh, 50 studies were looked at and they found out that they reported 0.7 to 27%. So there's a big, there's a big range of difference there. And we need to find out what is the reason why there's such a big range because 0.7% is a lot different to 27%. That's like saying in a classroom of 30 people, it's a difference between having say one, one person with a gaming disorder or um, 10 people in that classroom having a gaming disorder. That's a big difference. Okay, so they said that it was higher among males than females and they tended to be higher among younger than older people in the studies. They said that the location made little difference to the prevalence and the factors associated with internet gaming disorder reported in 28 of the 37 cross-sectional. So they talked about the factors associated with it. Yep. In most of them, they, they covered lots of different things such as um, the demographics, family factors, interpersonal relationships, social and school functioning and personality, other psychiatric conditions and other physical conditions. Longitudinal studies identified the risk and protective factors and health and social consequences of um, internet gaming disorder. So if I were you Lachlan, I would definitely look up these studies to find out for yourself uh, and find the answers rather than just getting me to give you the answers from my perspective, which I'm happy to do today. But if you really want to go down the rabbit hole today, I would suggest that you look up these studies. And if you need any help finding these studies or getting the copy of them, just ask your school librarian and I'm sure they will help you find these studies because that skill of finding the actual studies is very useful, very useful to have, and it will serve you for um, the rest of your life. Because, you know, we, you want to be able to find reliable in sources of information and be able to tell apart studies which are probably, um, you know, trustworthy or not trustworthy. Okay, so they looked at the methods here um, and the results are all here. Now, in, interestingly enough, they put it into a table and you can find out by a country, you can see UK, Germany, Netherlands, Germany, Netherlands, France, Norway. Now, you, if you scroll down, you actually find two studies done by um, universities in Australia. This one here, Thomas and Heritage are from Tasmania. 
you can see uh, what year they did this study, 2010. So that's 10 years old, pretty old. They looked at students in secondary school schools, uh, ages between 12 and 17, males and females, pretty similar, 500-ish, 500-ish, total of almost a thousand students. And they looked at using the computer game addiction on the young diagnostic questionnaire. Um, they looked at video arcade addiction. And this actual study was the one that was actually 0.7%. So I'll explain to you a little bit more why it was so low in this particular one, but you, you need to realize that they each study probably used different definitions and different questionnaires to ask their volunteers uh, whether they were addicted or not. So the second one here is also um, uh, from Australia and that's from King and the University of Adelaide in 2013. They looked at again student samples in Adelaide and they had a total of 1,200 students and they looked at another different questionnaire, um, greater than five out of 10 questions on the pathological technology use checklist for video gaming. So I'll just quickly go to the articles. So this is the Adelaide one. Uh, this is a Taiwanese one. I'll just go to the Tasmanian one first. So this was done 10 years ago. They looked at video arcade games, computer games and internet activities of Australian students. Uh, you can see here their sample was, you know, reasonably large. They looked at um, high schools and university students. And they found that there was a low, lower percentage of students met the criteria for video arcade games, 4.2% computer games, 5% and internet, uh, around about 5% again. So I think the key difference here is, is that they used video arcade games, which require money. Um, and, you know, we, not that many kids play the actual arcade machines anymore. They, we're more likely to play um, video games online, which are a lot cheaper. And the games are a lot more addictive, I would say. So you can't really compare um, apples with oranges in this in this situation. So they're both fruits, but they're very different types of fruit. One's uh, a very older fruit and that's not so addictive. The one is a newer fruit, which is much, much more addictive. And the prevalence of, um, however, they found social computer game users was 55% uh, and internet addiction almost 60% was higher than reported by past researchers. So again, these non online forms of gaming didn't score very high on addiction. But when it came to the social aspects of computer games and internet game and internet addiction, much, much higher. So I'll leave you to uh, look this one up. Um, you can look at the study yourself and look at the methods that they use to to find the volunteers and the questions they asked them and the types of questions they asked. So I'll just close that one down. I just want to go down to the second article, which is the clinical features and access one comorbidity of Australian adolescent pathological internet and video game users. This was done seven years ago. If you really want to find a breakdown of this article, I did this on my website, cgiclinic.com. Um, and they found out that they recruited, you know, over 1200 students, 12 to 18 years. They looked at 50 high schools, which were randomly selected in Adelaide. Seven schools participated. Um, and they used the pathological technology use checklist and some other checklists as well. Um, so the main findings were 
pathological technology use around about 11 percent problematic use of the internet about six percent internet and video games three percent video games less than two percent the prevalence of both problematic internet use and problematic video game use was about three percent so overall we're looking at um you know around about that four percent mark definitely less than 10 percent but every now and then you'll find a study that has you know over 10 percent over 20 percent yeah one of those studies is actually uh this study which was done in taiwan i think which is the psychiatric symptoms in adolescents with internet addiction comparison with substance use so they looked at teenagers who are addicted to the internet versus um, substances. And this is a common question that I get often, you know, if my kid is addicted to video games, is that better than them being addicted to substances? And are they going to be more addicted to substances down the track? So their methods were they looked at over 3000 students, most of them male. Um, you know, that's a lot. That's like three times as large as the Australian studies. The results were they found that internet addiction and substance use in adolescents was associated with more severe psychiatric symptoms and mental health problems. Personality things such as hostility and depression were associated with internet addiction and substance use after controlling for other symptoms. They came to the conclusion that it partially supports the hypothesis that internet addiction should be included in the organization of problem behavior theory. And it is suggest suggested that prevention and intervention can be best carried out when grouped with other problem behaviors. Moreover, more attention should be devoted to hostile and depressed adolescents in the design of preventative strategies and related therapeutic interventions for internet addiction. So what they're saying is, is that teenagers who are a bit more sort of maybe a little bit more easily agitated, edgy, angsty, or depressed, we should be giving them more help because if we help those students, uh, this is going to prevent them from getting an internet addiction or video game addiction. So you can see here that, you know, there's lots of different definitions in this um, cross-sectional review. You know, some definitions are based on internet addiction, some are based on pathological technology addiction, some are based on video game addiction, some are based on gaming disorder. So they've, they've kind of grouped together lots and lots of different studies and none of them are all the same, the way they've done the methods, the techniques, the way they've recruited people, the number of people and the criteria. So it's really important that moving forward, now that we have gaming disorder as a recognized problem, that studies, future studies should be using the gaming disorder as a criteria so we can more accurately describe this problem and identify this problem much better. So the factors that led to um, internet gaming disorder are, are from these cross-sectional studies were longer time on games, the gender, younger age, higher frequency of playing games, so a longer time spent playing every day, playing more often, the types of games, shooting and war games, fighting games, strategy games. Again, time, the longer number of years you've spent playing video games, aggressive behavior, having friends who are addicted to video games, lower school grades, higher frequency of hand, finger, wrist pains. Oh, okay, these are the um, negative consequences. ADHD was a consequence, physical fight, fighting, again, time spent, frequency, uh, low, so if you have a low life satisfaction, low social competence, you're not really able to um, socialize with people as, um, as well as others. This led to more loneliness and aggression uh, increased smoking, drug use, lower caffeine consumption. So this is a really nice table for you for your research study because you can actually, you know, it's all written down here for you, those questions. Um, 
So the effects are on here. This is one of your questions. The effects um, and also um, the factors leading to it. Okay. All right, so in terms of prevention and treatment, it's a very good question. I think the, the basic prevention is more awareness, more education in the community. I'll stop screen sharing. Um, actually, I just wanna, there was one. Um, that's all right. I'll stop screen sharing here. So in terms of prevention and treatment, look, more awareness and education is great. Um, students like yourself, Lachlan, who are looking at this as a research project means that the message is getting out there, that you find this topic important, that you find this topic interesting and that you find this topic worthwhile your time and that you will benefit from your year 12 studies. And maybe this will influence your choice in career at maybe university and maybe um, finding a job in this area because this is going to be a growing area. Also, what I've noticed with the COVID restrictions and lockdowns, because I'm seeing patients from all over Australia, I see patients in um, rural remote areas um, via telehealth. So I, I, I see them through the internet like this. And especially the families where the kids are from Victoria and New South Wales, they're suffering and they're having more problems leaving the home, not going to school, because they've not been able to do their usual things like sporting activities, group activities, and they're too afraid to leave their home. They, f they feel more anxiety, more fear, and now they are escaping and relieving their symptoms of distress via escapism through video games or the internet or watching online movies. So in terms of um, prevention, we should be offering um, young people, you know, activities outside the home that don't require the internet that are just as cheap as the internet. The, the internet is cheap. Like, I mean, sending your kid to a season of footy is going to set you back, you know, easily $500 a year. And if you've got multiple kids, you're looking at thousands and thousands of dollars. When you get an internet subscription is very cheap. Unless of course your child starts, stealing credit card monies to spend money on microtransactions, that sort of thing. So in terms of prevention, providing alternate activities that are accessible, convenient and cheap for Australian kids is going to help prevent this problem. Thirdly, um, parents need to be able to have the authority and the tools to set limits for their kids. Um, yesterday I saw a mum who is actually pulling out the modem at 8 p.m locking it in a physical safe so that her daughter cannot access the internet because if their daughter had access to the internet, she would not sleep. This is the extent some people are getting to. So we need to be able to um, give parents the ability to set limits to turn the internet off because these games never stop. The other aspect is um, so we've got um, parenting, other activities. Um, what's the other one? Uh, lockdown, prevention, oh, loot boxes. So loot boxes, I've, I've just published uh, on my website um, some feature articles on loot boxes. So in 2018, the Australian government met to discuss whether we should ban um, loot boxes, which is essentially um, a, what they call a chance based item and the ability to buy these via microtransactions in video games, such as um, Fortnite V-Bucks to buy battle passes, to buy loot llamas. And the Australian government decided 
that we should not ban them, even though countries like Belgium and the Netherlands have banned them, they decide that we cannot ban them because we, as a gamer, you can't cash those items out for real money. There are, there are obviously some gambling aspects to those items, but because you can't cash out that money for real money, is not considered gambling under the Australian definition of gambling. Now, yesterday, I had a young person tell me that in Roblox, kids game, people are designing games where you can um, buy Robux, like virtual currency, and buy game passes, which allow you to win or earn uh, virtual items, um, skins or cosmetic items, or um, limitings or very limited scarce items that are very powerful and that there are third party websites which you can use to cash these items out for real money and that people go onto these third party websites to buy those items and pay money through paypal because these items are a lot cheaper than getting them in the game so that is essentially completing that gambling loop by saying that Although the game is not designed for you to cash out the money, someone has designed a loophole, a third party loophole to make it possible for you to cash out for real money. So that essentially makes Roblox a form of gambling for some people, not all people, but for some people. So if we are able to regulate the games much better to either say what are the odds of winning to say you know that we should restrict the ages of these gambling type mechanics for adults only then you're going to prevent a lot of kids who are disengaged from school disengaged from their real lives and um, escaping into video games in terms of treatment obviously this is a really um, difficult thing to tackle because the treatments will always include some form of abstinence, some form of detox, whether it's one day or three days or 90 days. Um, I would recommend that you look up um, the Australian study done by University of Adelaide and Flinders University looking at the 84 hour abstinence protocol, which found out that if you detox for just 84 hours, you reduce negative cognitions and gaming time um, down the track. And also look at Game Quitter's 90 day detox the Game Quitters 90 Day Detox is where um, young adults um, go in an online forum and they commit to 90 days off video games and they get help from other people in the game, you know, in the forum to stay on track and to stay um, detoxed off their video games. Um, in other countries, you've got you know, boot camps in China, you've got clinics in Korea, you've got clinics in Japan, you've got clinics in Singapore. I see people online by telepsychiatry around Australia. So I see a few cases a week. Um, when I was running my clinic in the Women's and Kids Hospital, I was seeing maybe one new case per week um, of kids who were being violent because their games were taken away, they were not going to school or their grades dropped or they were stealing money or lying to their parents because of this. I had one young person who was soiling themselves because they were gaming. Um, and yeah, it's a growing problem. It's a growing problem because everyone is working from home now during COVID and the games are very cheap and they're not regulated. So I hope these answered some of your questions. Um, it's really great to engage with young people and help them in their school projects and this helps me ultimately to spread the word about the dangers and effects of video game addiction also tune into my uh, sbs online documentary that's coming out in october 2020 uh, it's called are you addicted to technology and it's looking at all the different mechanics in um, internet um, technology and why we are becoming more and more addicted to this is really exciting and I hope that you found this video today useful um, so please check out my Facebook group Dr Kim Lee Psychiatrist or cgiclinic.com thanks again see ya